my instructions from were that I wasn't talking about boring health and safety stuff. I had to make it try and be interesting. I can't guarantee it's interesting, but it won't be just health and safety stuff. Okay. So what we're going to talk about is, and so I shall have, I'm glad Victoria's here because I want brandy points from Chris to talk to you about sustainability, okay? Of course. Okay. <laughs> and, okay. What I'm going to do is, I've been involved as a, in an investigation this year for the uh, Victorian government over a, an incident that occurred at a large brown coal mine in Victoria. And it's probably the best example I know of where an issue which was dealt with as an occupational health and safety issue was in fact much broader than that. It has much bigger applications. So, you know, we'll use the definition of sustainable development. And you look at things like economic activity. Obviously, the brown coal mine generates power for Victoria, so it's key to their, their future. Environmental integrity, well, there's a few problems there we'll get to. Social concerns, bigger problems there we'll get to. And effective governance, well, what's the other issue we'll have to deal with? Um, you know, 10 principles, we are looking good. We are 101, we're going to have to do the introductory course next year, 7053. <coughs> you know, but there are things like, and when you look at the report from the investigation, the, court of, the board of inquiry, and you look at these 10 principles, you can mark the company on those yourself. Um, ethical business practices, things like the fact that they didn't talk to anybody at all uh, during the, during the incident. They maintained a very low profile. They tried to refuse to give the government any documents. It could be argued it's not really ethical. Um, Same old development practices. Well, when you see the incident and the, the implications for the local community, you wonder about how sustainable this really is. Fundamental human rights, respect for cultures. Well, human rights about local communities is probably a big issue there. Risk management strategies. Well, risk management comes to port, not just health and safety, but the power station associated with the mine produces one third of the power of the state of Victoria. So where's the economic risk assessment? Where's the likelihood of the power station shutting down and therefore plunging Victoria into, into blackout consideration, for example? Health and safety, well, it's pretty self-evident. Environmental, it's an interesting one because this is quite unusual. You know, this mine is adjacent to a town of 14,000 people. And also the main arterial road that runs from Melbourne to Gippsland runs right by the top of the mine. When I say adjacent to the township of 14,000 people is 400 metres from the mine. Um, it's been there a long time. Biodiversity, probably not a big issue in this particular case, except the, the natural environment struck back. Uh, recycled you know, dispose of products. You know, interesting disposal of a lot of things there is a problem. You'll see that. And of course the social and economic development of the community. This town is totally dependent on this, on this mine. So the whole community is wrapped up with this mine. So there's this conflict between, well, if we complain too much, the mine will go away, so therefore the town will die. All those sort of issues come to play. Although the only thing that the mine did after the incident was to offer each of the households $700 voucher. That was their way of compensating them for the discomfort. So that's the, that's the economic price they paid put on it. And it transparent engagement communication. Well, we'll see that as we go through, that there was probably no transparent communication by the company at all. It's also probably a good idea, and this is just shows how limited my knowledge of sustainability is, we'll use the five capital model to, to focus some of the issues. And it's important because if we go beyond the traditional way of looking at, at, at issues from a health and safety perspective or an environmental disaster, to put it in some of this context. You know, around the mine, there, are, there is a natural area. There is a forested area, a quite a large forested area. And in fact, it was the impact of the forested area on the mine that caused the problem because it was a bushfire. So it's sort of in that nature strikes back. Um, well, that was an arson attack. But there is an interplay between the two. And if you, those who have been to Victoria know that the bushfires in Victoria are very common in summer. And on this particular day, there were 200 burning across the state. And there were 20 in the immediate environment of the, of the thing. So considering the natural, natural environment is very important in its impact upon the mine, not just the other way around. Now, consuming energy and, and waste, well, that's a different issue. Water is a big problem in the mine. It has too much water. It actually is mining below the water table. So it has a lot of water on site. One of the ironies was that they had so much water in the pit, they actually couldn't use the fire out because they lost power. Okay. Human capital, the workforce. A healthy, motivated, skilled workforce. This area is a privatised mine. It used to be state government, run by the SCCV. So the workforce has been right-sized for many years uh, to a much smaller number than the state government had. And there's a lot of argument at the inquiry about adequacy of resources. The firefighting teams, 
how many teams there were, the number of firefighting crews, the expertise to deal with the issue and the nature of the issue. So were they compromising health and safety because they did cut the workforce back, the training levels, the expertise, all those sorts of things come to play. Right? The social interactions. The company's response to this was that the CFA, the community, the country fire authority, should put the fire out. So they relied on the community to actually manage the incident, which was, was a challenge. And you know, to get this community involved on the side, this thing about trust and shared values. Well, when you don't talk to the community at all, uh, it's a real difficult problem. And also, if you look, go back and look at the news reports of the health officer briefing the community upon the health impacts, the potential health impacts of this fire, it's also an interesting case study of was there trust, was there belief in what she was saying? Because absence of data, you know, this paternalism almost, don't you worry about that, it's not a problem. And then 14 days into the incident, they evacuated the entire town. So where's the trust in that issue? Where's the credibility then? It's not a problem, all of a sudden, it is a problem. So, and then the, the social structures to support that. The need to do, what are you going to do with 14,000 people? Where do you put them? How do you support them in that time? How do you provide you know, social services and things to support that? Um, for example, you know, the state government estimated they spent $40 million dealing with this fire, which they want their money back. But that's the cost of that fire, indirect economic costs, rather than indirect economic costs. Manufactured capital, well, they're pretty lucky. The power station kept going. <coughs> but seeing goodness, one of three in Victoria, if it had been, <coughs> there would have been blackouts, as it had been in a previous incident at the adjacent line in uh, 2007, I think it was, when the mine got flooded. So there are a lot of issues to deal with man, you know, maintaining the capital and, and getting value out of it. And of course, financial, big issue. You know? It's not, you know, when, you, when your mine goes offline for a month and a half, it's a big economic loss. Jobs, you know, people, what happened to all the people <coughs> and the workers? And the spin-off benefits, you know, the town, for example, was evacuated. So all the businesses in that town had no revenue for that period of time at all. Now, if you're a small business, you often don't have the viability, you know, your, your cash flow is day to day, month to month. It isn't strategic. So what do you do? How do you survive that? You know, um, the company itself, you know, the power station kept going, but the mine didn't. So where, what do we do viability? What are we getting paid for things, you know, the top contracts and things? And brand reputation. What's the reputation of the company in Victoria now? And bigger brand reputation, what's the reputation of state government in Victoria now? It will lose the next election in Victoria, which happens to be this weekend. And one of the marginal seats is a seat where the mine is. So, of course, there's adverse publicity, adverse impact upon that. So, it's a, it does, this incident does represent in many ways a lot, examples of a lot of these factors. This is the mine. <coughs> it's a very large open cut coal mine. Brown coal. So it's five kilometres from end to end. I'll find the laser button. From this end to there. And it's about two to three kilometres long here. Okay. It is very unusual in that the coal seam is 100 metres deep <coughs> and 10 metres below the surface. And in fact, there's another 100 metre deep coal seam underneath that one. It is brown coal, so it's basically rubbish. But you can burn it in a power station. Uh, the power station sits there. So there's no stockpiles, it goes straight to the power station and it's burnt. You cannot stockpile brown coal because it burns by itself, spontaneously combusts. So there's the sort of the first flag thinking, this could be a problem. But the mining over here, and all these areas here are abandoned. Now some of them have been rehabilitated, but all these areas here have not. All, this, all these bent little benches, they're 22 metres high to 30 metres high, the face is coal. Each of those is an exposed coal face. Over here, there are more exposed coal faces, and all in here, the coal has not been covered. Now, why? Because they didn't have to. The law the rehabilitation didn't require them until 2019. Because it's a, it's a massive cost. It's a lot of money to move dirt you haven't got around to cover these things. Now, this area down here is where they're mining. And in the area where they're mining, because it's an acknowledged Hazard of fire, there are water reticulation systems in place, massive water mains that will spray the water to keep it wet. Brown coal in its mine is 60% water, so more than half of it is water. When you dry brown coal out and it becomes powdery and it's like touch paper. Now, so it is a very reactive coal. So any emission source that you apply to it will cause a fire. 
it has had, this particular pit has had large fires in the mine four times in the last 10 years. Several that last weeks, and they're all internally created. Uh, vehicle fire, uh, fire on the conveyor belt, lightning strike, sort of thing. and they were massive fires. So there is a history of large fires at this mine over, the, over its lifetime. And there used to be water systems up in this area here, all over these things and all over these things. But over the years, they rusted out and they weren't replaced. So normally in an open cut mine, the, the amount of coals exposed is quite small, and it's the seam dips, so there's not a huge exposed area. And the old areas are covered immediately. Not finely rebuilt, but they're covered with waste or other material. And the seam is not normally this wide. I mean, mine is mine for at least 70 years, 80 years. So it's an old mine. It's been a very mature thing, very stable, but very unusual. They should do that. But then you get this fire. And that's not a small fire. You can see the smoke. There's the, the, the high wall on the, near the town. The town is just here. And that is the Princess Highway. So we are talking, you know, sorry, the town's over there, it's on one side. The town's over there, the, mine, the power station's just over here, and you can see the smoke. In this case, the wind is blowing that direction, but most of the time, the prevailing wind pattern in Victoria is west southwesterly. So it blows, in fact, in that direction. And to put the, what, what happened, there was a bushfire, or a series of bushfires in Victoria in the area, I'll just go back. I don't know, that's different. Uh, up here, there's, there's a forest just here and a forest down here. Under the prevailing patterns on the day, the wind was blowing across the line. The, the weather conditions, by the way, were 44 degrees centigrade, with winds blowing 70 kilometres an hour plus. And so it was what they call at the mine a high risk day, an acknowledged high risk day because of the wind conditions and weather conditions. There were approximately, say, 20 fires burning in the immediate environment, and these two fires were burning adjacent to the mine. The analogy would be if you took a whole pile of newspapers and spread it on the ground and started throwing matches onto it. So embers were, no, it's seriously because the embers from the fires are thought to blow into the open cut pit. You have an open cut brown coal which is dry, it is highly reactive, and lo and behold, it starts to burn. Now, within two hours, you end up something like that. So we're talking about fires burning on the high walls, two kilometres long, okay, and 100 metres high. You're talking about over the back there, the same thing. So the fire spread. Once it gets into the coal and you blow with the wind across the face, it's just like you know, fanning the fire. So it grew very rapidly. And the resources available within the mine could not contain it easily. So you can see, for example, there's the power station. And you can see how close it got to, 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 to actually affecting the fire. And in fact, the conveyor belts were set on fire. All sorts of interesting things happened like that that did threaten to... Um, uh, disrupt the power supply. You know, you know, for those of you who like artistic things, there's, there's a, you know, if this is fire, can't be artistic, there's sort of a nice fire at night scene. You, know. you can see the red, you know, the, 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 the active, can't be the active fire is in that area, and the, 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 uh, the wind blowing up into the bench is so spreading. So that's a real problem, it's not easy. We're not talking about, the difference between this sort of fire and a bushfire is a bushfire moves rapidly, it burns. Limited amount of fuel keeps burning, and it keeps burning because there's more fuel. When you've got millions of tons of coal sitting there, and it gets into the coal, it doesn't move, it just gets deeper and deeper and bigger and bigger and a lot more energy. It becomes harder and harder to put out. Again, more, you know, more size of the, the benches, because it's a vertical face. And so the heating environment creates a chimney effect, so of course, it just self perpetuates. On average, there were 200 firefighting units a day fighting this fire for 47 days. 600 people on average uh, to try and put it out. And you know, we had helicopters, uh, water moving truck um, uh, planes, uh, firefighting trucks coming from airports with special foam, everything technology known to man to try and put it out. There's the infrared photo from the surface. Uh, about three days in, you can see the red is the hottest part of the fire, the white is the colder part of the fire. But you can see the extensive nature of the fire. Bearing in mind that's five kilometres from there to there, so you're looking at a fire front on this side burning over two, two to three kilometres in coal. So imagine your fire that you have at home in your fireplace, it's about maybe a metre, it's going to fly by 2,000 times and probably you know, hundreds of times higher as well. That's the, 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 the complexity that's facing the firefighters and the energy. So there are fire problems for the firefighters because they're in a deep pit, so the carbon dioxide poisoning. 
heat explosion. Um, you know, rotating people through. It was the middle of summer in Victoria, which is either perfect one day, you know, freezing cold, and then boiling the next. And of course, when there's hot winds and it's blowing like that, they are fighting in an environment where they can only last a few minutes. Yeah. So treatment of firefighters is a real problem. But that ignores the poor old community. And here we have the smoke blowing over the town. Why is this a problem? Well, smoke contains a thing called PM2.5. It's the sub-2.5 micron dust particles. Now, those who are environmental scientists will know that there is no safe exposure standard for 2.5 micron particles. It is an advisory standard, but there is actually no safe value because it goes right into the lungs and has a long history causing respiratory problems. In addition, smoke like that indicates it's not complete combustion. If it's not complete combustion, when you burn coal, you get a toxic mix of chemicals. We can do what are called PAHs. There's a whole cocktail of organics, which can be carcinogenic. So the local community was saying, what's, the problem? You know, what's going on here? And the Victorian EPA had to put up monitoring to try and fight, establish the problem. And it took them two weeks before they decided it was dangerous and we should evacuate the town. And those sort of pictures have been there ever since the uh, first day. So it was a major problem. But evacuating 14,000 people is a big issue. Where do you put them? What do you do with them? How do you do it in an orderly manner? So the social issues of managing this issue are, are enormous. Now, the state government took the responsibility. The company was nowhere to be seen. You know, the, 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 the briefings were all done by the CFA, the health department, that sort of thing. You know, you get pictures like this all over the press. You know, people are advised to stay inside and close their windows. You know, when you see this pool of smoke over your town, you see things like the soot from the fire when it sits on, the, on, on, on areas on, you know, around your house and it's that thick, you know, it's not, we're not talking a little bit of soot, we're talking huge amounts of soot. The emotional <coughs> impact on people is, especially if you tell them nothing, they are scared and there's lots of press around that will make them concerned about the potential impact. So you have to deal with the social issue uh, in a big way. You know, you get public meetings. I don't know. And the, the local community was very angry, not surprised them, because they have been told nothing. And you know, when the fire goes on for 47 days and it doesn't appear to be getting any better and being under control because it's such a big thing, they are just about to be concerned. And so imagine the, the community outrage, which is, you know, CSRM's uh, there is, is very important. You've got to manage the, the issue without it uh, you know, becoming hysteria. And effective communication and trust and all those things have to be reestablished. You know, all over local news, national news, you know, big impact. You know, people asking questions, how it could it happen? You know? So it is an, it's, it's not a health and safety issue at the mine, because no mine worker was harmed. It is a social issue, it is an environmental issue. You know? you know, the event is actually quite simple. We had a, a bushfire that spotted into the mine. We had over a million square metres of exposed coal that was sitting there, okay? brown coal, it was dry, in an area that was hot, high wind temperatures, that is a, a, a catalyst for, for, for a fire. It was in the abandoned of the mine with no uh, effective control in place, so you know, you're harmful to the workers or harmful to the public, the two possible outcomes. And I left off loss of power. Can I ask, did the fire establish in the operational part of the no, mine? Well? No, no, it flew over that into the abandoned area, because in the operational part they had the water sprays. Yeah, okay, okay. So, managing it so, they, so therefore, would it have set fire there? We don't know, but they put the water sprays on. They do that routinely, by the way, because if the coal dries out, it can start to spontaneously combust. Ah, that's yeah, okay. But this area was further away, so it actually flew uh, probably two kilometres from the edge of the mine into the mine before the, the embers took the part. But the wind was blowing pretty strong as well, strongly as well, I should say. And also, if you look at the, the topography, you've got a, like a saucer shape, if you will. Yeah. And so the, the operational side is on the downside of the saucer, whereas the other side, the one with the upside, is the, where the abandoned areas were. <coughs> so it's, you know, it's pretty true. That's um, the, 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 the two forest fires that started, one at Driffield, that burnt in that direction. You can see the direction of burnt, which, you know, you could say, it doesn't take Albert Einstein to think if it burnt in that direction, there's the, there's the mine. Um, what past going to get, you know, this one, you know, and this one also burnt in that direction, so, and there's the town of Morwell. Okay. And there's the power station and the, the bondage. Now, there are lots of interesting things. The, this is regarded as a state asset by the state government, so there is a, a state emergency response plan for it as well, because I can't afford to lose the power. But on the day in question, we want the CFA to come and fight the fire, they're already fighting 20 other fires. 
And there are things like, well, let's see if I arrived, I couldn't get into the mine because the gates were padlocked. I didn't ever keep the padlock. So the coordination, mood response is all wrong. And see if I guys, you know, are outside, have no experience in fighting coal fires. Bushfires, yes, great, but coal fires are a very different beast. So there's, you know, the, you know, there's the issues. If you do a risk assessment, you know, was a bushfire unlikely? Well, not in Victoria. Bushfires are quite common. And it's acknowledged hazard. If you look at their, the mines management systems, they recognise bushfires as a potential source of ignition. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had higher alert days when they were bushfires, you know, those conditions. The reactive area of the coal, well, they hadn't rehabilitated it. Now, there's a lot of argument with what they should have done, what they needed to do, but there's this thing about, well, we didn't have to. Um, and I did say to the inquiry, well, we don't talk about have to, or we shouldn't talk about have to under Australian legislation. It's, it's management, not compliance. So it's a million square metres. Now, it costs a lot of money. The real reason is they, haven't, they didn't rebuild it, it's because it was money. And without being required to have it done, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't afford to do it. And of course, high wind temperature was Victorian summer. So the fire started, and they couldn't put it out because there was no articulation system. And the firefighting capacity they had for a fire of that size was totally adequate. When you've got five fire trucks total in the mine, or five water, five water carrying vehicles in a mine, how do you fight a fire that's burning on a two kilometre front? You know, it's just not going to happen. So the risk assessment and the contingency planning for this issue was totally inadequate. Also, um, one of the issues that came up very quickly was the power supply for the water in the mine, the pumps in the mine, came down the high wall where the fire was. So it burned through. So the, water, the pumps didn't have any energy. So there's no water. It doesn't help. So there's no scenario mapping, no what if contingency plan at all. And this is a catastrophic risk. So you have to be very careful that you do go through the what ifs because if you get it wrong, you will end up with, oh and behold, a huge fire. So risk management, risk assessment of this issue, I would contend was totally inadequate. And still going to be argued about it. I think that if you look at the, the factors, you're not talking about a lot of slices of Swiss cheese in a line for this to happen. You're talking about three, each of which in its own are not unlikely because the mine has a history of fires for various sorts, large fires. Three in the last, at least three, 2006 and 2008 particularly. And no one said, well, what happens for, on local community? There was no consideration in their planning of impact of fire on local community, like it's fine. The defence, the company GDF Sue, is saying, well, they comply with the law. <coughs> you know, so they did everything the law will require. But they were certified to Australian Standard 4801, which is not just management standard. So therefore, if you are certified to a management standard, you must demonstrate that you manage, and that you manage the risk adequately. Now, you know, if you do our risk management courses, you know what they are, you'll see that triggers for review are past events. There's no evidence the previous fires have triggered a review of the management systems to see if they're adequate. There's no evidence that I could find that people said, well, what if this happens, what do we do? The response to the company was it was a perfect storm. Act of God, unpredictable, undefin un unpreventable. The commission inquiry did not accept that, 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 that position. You, know, you, you talk about the amount, the amount of cheese. Normally when we do a risk assessment, we do uh, bow ties, analysis of, of, of catastrophic events. There's a whole pile of improbable events that, just, that, that coincide together, very low probability events. And so it becomes you know, more difficult to predict. But you know, bushfire in Victoria, all that coal sitting there dry and hot, it's not that many slices of cheese, not that unreliable, you know, unpredictable. It, was un it hasn't happened before like that because it hasn't, that coal's only been there you know, uh, the last 20 years and it hasn't been that dry for that often. So with catch rate risk, we're not talking about high probability events. But it's still, I would contend, predictable. So it comes down to controlling effectiveness. Why, why didn't it prevent it? You know, or the, water, the water articulation used to be there, which stopped the fire from, from occurring or if, they, if they needed it to. You know, they had their own internal firefighting system under the state government, which they outsourced the CFA. So all sorts of things could be argued, reduce the effectiveness of the controls they had. You know, they had five fire hydrants in the pit to connect hoses to. That was their firefighting system you know, for that part of the mine. Now, if you do the risk assessment, you know, bushfire, common. You turn in summer, hot, dry day, provide thing. No rehab, if we're large area exposed coal. Major fires, as I said before, not near Van Nier and not bushfires, bush certainly, but they're big fires that show that if a fire starts in the mine, what the consequences are likely to be. That is, that the fire will burn for days and will have lots of, it will be a large so a size fire and it will impact upon the local environment. 
it is a high risk thing to depend on an external agency to come and fight the fire if they've got other things they've got to do. And bearing in mind the CFA is largely a volunteer organisation. So we are relying on volunteers for somebody to come and fight the fire. And also, how do you sustain it with volunteers for that length of time? The whole of, say, Victoria and New South Wales provide a uh, volunteer firefighters to put this fire out over a period of time. Okay? They, haven't tried, they haven't trained to try fight this sort of fire, so they didn't have access. They haven't tried to do things. So when they went there, for example, after a little while, when you put so much water on a fire, your trucks get bogged. So therefore they can't move. So you've all these practical issues. They hadn't done any real testing of their systems. You know? There wasn't any resilience. The single, fire, the single power supply burnt through, so the water stopped. And your local community, 40,000 people, 400 metres away, but nowhere could I find any evidence that there had been any assessment of the potential for fire on the local community. Because, to some extent, the legislation, the OH legislation, doesn't explicitly say that. So, you know, all these things. There's already been stuff in the paper, by the way, in the Victorian press, about, by some academics saying, well, there's already been an increase in mortality in the town. A much higher incidence of mortality in more than you'd expect. Epidemiology is really complicated, so whether it's true or not, I can't really say. The government said no, which is you'd expect them to say, um, whether it is true or not. But it is certainly an issue, because how will you know? Health effects, lung disease, impacts from dust take years to really come to, come to pass. You know? um, things like you know, emphysema, all those sort of lung conditions, asthma, they are seasonal events anyway. But and over time they start to appear. So, and there's no doubt exposure, according to the environmental sense, was vastly exceeded. This lack of knowledge and certainty from the government about what the potential impacts were caused them to lose trust. There were some very fiery public meetings where the government officials had to face a very angry and animated local community. And you know, you're going to feel sorry for the poor guys who are the face of the government because they're just doing their job. Whether they believe the words are saying completely or not, they are doing the best they can. You know, the government health officer was relying on advice from the EPA. The EPA were doing the monitoring they could to try and estimate the size of the risk. And it's a very fine line between saying, yep, yeah, you've got a major problem here, you're all going to die, and there's no problem at all. You know, it's not that, you know, risk communication is a very delicate topic to deal properly. They will lose the local seat. You know, there is most likely going to be litigation. You know, all the local businesses shut down for 45 days. The local loss of trust. The clean-up costs are enormous. There was, there was a prosecution, no, well, there was a fine on the IHS Act for failing to provide adequate fire, for, um, fire they call, um, barriers around the mine. They're supposed to have a fire break 50 metres right around the mine. They didn't. That's all the IHS Act could prosecute them for at this stage. However, you know, the company actions, and this is where I, I suppose I'm disappointed in the company. We'd like to think that a modern company in Australia, with its, if it's committed to sustainability, <coughs> would be more proactive, more open about what had happened. You know, there's no scenario about risk assessments. It was very reactive. It didn't investigate consequences. It didn't look. I mean, look, when you're short of resources, it's very easy not to, you know, because everything takes time and money. So doing risk assessments takes time. You've got to be experts. You've got to sit down and say, what if? You've got to do the scenarios. You've got to do your fault trees, your bow ties, thoroughly, to figure through these things out. If you don't do it, you make the answer. You don't ask questions, you don't get answers. So I would contend that they were more about the minimum stamp. What was enough to get the stamp from the government and not really being on the front foot of managing these issues? The RHS law does define that, it, that they must do more. They must manage risks of health and safety, but not, and not just for the workforce. Okay? So it does talk about harm being caused. You know, you'd say that, that causing 40,000 people to be back was a pretty severe <coughs> Harm, you know. The nature of the mining hazard, which is well known, fire in the pit, and the likelihood. Well, again, you know, they're not unlikely. So risks to all hazards, you know. The operator must have been really practical. They said it wasn't really practical. It was perfect storm. It's so unlikely. We're just so unlucky. I've worked in the mining industry for you know, 29 years. Every time I've been to a disaster, they've been so unlucky. You would not believe the way God works in the mining industry. <laughs> No? And, but it does say in the Victorian Act that a mine fire explosion is a mining hazard which must be managed. And so th th there is a little flag there saying, what have you done? And you know, they must also do safety hazards for major mining hazards. And this is where the law became a bit of a fool. 
because it has mining hazards and it defines major mining hazards and they're different. Because a major mining hazard is one that can cause the potential for multiple fatality. Now an overcut mine, a fire, is actually quite hard to cause multiple fatality. And they did these safety assessments, I said, see we've done the right thing. And their argument was, we've done these safety assessments, the government hasn't complained, so we must be doing okay. So the sin of omission was used as compliance, in other words, uh, that they've done the right thing. Now, in Victoria, it's a small mining industry. So the OHS inspectors are part of the general OHS inspectorate. So they are not specialists. They are not specialist mining department. Though the guys have mining experience, there are two guys with mining experience in the OHS inspectorate. One's an electrician, one's a mechanic. Not comparable to what we have in the major mining states. In the, mining major, in the major mining states, the mines inspectors are separate. They are mine managers by training and experience. So very experienced, very knowledgeable. A very different world of expertise to this environment. So therefore, if you have inspectors who have not specialist knowledge and skills, it is very unreasonable to assume that they will be able to tease these things out if the company couldn't. And after all, they look after a number of mines and you know, a number of operations. So why would they, they have much less time than mine has to identify these hazards? You know, and they do have a duty. The, the, the government, sorry, the company does have a duty as an employer. Persons other than employees are not exposed to risks of health and safety from the conduct of the undertaking. And the company tried to say, but we didn't do anything. We said, well, isn't mining the undertaking? Didn't the, if, the mine, if the mine wasn't there, wouldn't it, the fire wouldn't have happened. You can't burn through the overburden to get to the coal seam. You know? So your mining created, created the situation. The OHS Act is not being used to prosecute the company at the present time because it's so vague. Um, and they believe that the chance of proving this would be Difficult. I don't think you're right. I think they could have prosecuted myself. Um, but the interesting thing is, there is the environmental law as well. And the environmental law is a bit different because it says you cannot, you know, to do anything reasonable to prevent an environmental hazard. So if, if, if there is an environmental hazard, you're guilty of an indictable offence. So lots of grey smoke, Category 1 pollution, therefore it's, it's an environmental hazard, therefore you're guilty of an environmental offence. You know, and a person should not pollute the atmosphere, right? All these things, which, you know, you know must have all reasonable steps. So again, the, the, the atmosphere was polluted, the town was evacuated. There's a prima facie case that they failed Section 41. Now, it is quite possible that there will be a prosecution under the Environmental Act. But the company had to demonstrate that it did, that it could not um, predict that they would pollute the town. You know, and they did anything reasonable to prevent the town from being polluted. Now, when you have look at the history of fires and things, I should be very intrigued to see what sort of mental gymnastics they go through to argue that they could not uh, pre prevent it, you know, that they could not see the town as a hazard. Because I've seen no documentation from the company that indicates that the, any impact off site was considered. So when you look at the, the model of sustainability and this mine, its operation, and the operation of the company in terms of sustainability, it doesn't do very well, I don't think. I, I think that you have to say, you know, just, as a member of the community, but not just the local community, more than the state of Victoria, how did it act in terms of preventing issues, managing issues? And we have to put in front the framework of where it sits. It's a commercial company making money. It is mining a coal which is not very high calorie value. You don't make a lot of money on the mining brown coal. You have fixed contracts, it's all, you know, but there's no spare capital. There's no doubt in my mind that economics drove the lack of control, the fact that they didn't replace the pipes, that they didn't do all the remediation. I'm sure they would have, if they had the money, they would have done it, or they'd been forced to. But we don't, Australia doesn't work under, under, under regime of compliance. It works under regime of management and, and responsibility. So I think looking at this as a, not as a health and safety issue, or as an environmental issue, but as a, sustain, a failure of sustainability is a, a much more important, a much more relevant thing to do. Because you know the companies need to look at these issues and, and go beyond their traditional, you know, uh, it's a, a narrow focus on a particular hazard to look at the outcomes. You know. It could have quite easily have plunged Victoria into, into darkness. Uh, when your lawn power station went down after the pick up flooded for three months, there was rationing across the state in the middle of winter. Now Victoria in the middle of winter is not that close to heaven. Okay? <laughs> and if you haven't got any power, it's a cold, damp, dark, wet place. And that cost the state government the election. So, you know, and it costs manufacturing. All those things happen. So the, the impacts are very high. 
potentially impact the very high. How do they keep the mine running if they don't have any stockpiles? They've got to fill up adjacent mines and building. And, and in fact, the irony was the operation here is able to mine still because yeah. it follows the other parts of the mine. They had conveyor systems, and so they, they, they managed the conveyors and kept the sprays and things on them to keep the mine going. It was it was interesting interesting um, juxtaposition of risks and you know viability and things. Um, it was quite a challenge to do that. But because the system of mining doesn't require trucks, it requires conveyor belts and these huge bucket wheel dredges, um, they are able to mine in this little <coughs> the size over there and keep it keep it going. It was nip and tuck um, the whole time. But there's no capacity. You know, if you're doing a risk assessment on capacity, there was, they couldn't suddenly say crank up another pit or another now power station because they don't have it. So, you know, these, these three power stations and the three mines produce 80% plus of the, of the electricity supply of Victoria. The, the main other alternative is the hydro scheme, you know, which has limited capacity in the summer because there's no rain for them. So you know, the impacts, and there is certainly major implications. The state government's going through a major review now because of its, fire, of its, its liabilities and its ability to control and manage these issues because it recognises that it's a state asset and it has all these management you know, typical bureaucrats. They have all these emerging response plans, at state level, at regional level, at local government level. They're all supposed to kick in and done something. But they didn't. And maybe they couldn't. So you could ask the question, is that the appropriate way of managing those issues? Why is the government taking responsibility for what is a private enterprise operation? Is that a reasonable thing to do? And I think that's about it.